academic and pedagogical credentials to this task. She is also a Stanford product, having <laughs> done her graduate work here in the Department of Communication after she finished a bachelor's cum laude from UCLA in political science. And I actually wondered if someone at the Daily Maybe. knew that you'd started out in poli <laughs> so. Uh, her career totally belies the unfair statement that all of us who are involved in teaching have heard that those who do, those who can do and those who can't teach because not only is she a wonderful teacher, she won the h &S Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching in 1986, but she is also a highly successful doer, being a producer, a director, and an editor with a dozen films to her credit. They have ranged broadly in their topics from Riding the Tiger, which uh, examines the role of B-52s that engaged in carpet bombing in Vietnam, but were later dismantled under the START II Treaty, to another film, Silver Feet, which followed three young dancers as they tried to fulfill their dream of entering the world of professional ballet. But her films don't just explore significant and often difficult territory, they are also highly acclaimed, being shown at many, many film festivals here and abroad, receiving ribbons or other kinds of prizes, and demonstrating the power of film to inform us, to move us, to influence us, and above all, to help us to reconsider and to reflect. But great as Chris's dedication and love of film is, and I asked her if it was okay to mention she's a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Um, she's also deeply dedicated to the university and to her students. As I mentioned, she's now chairing her department. She's also been a resident fellow for seven years, and she chaired the Faculty Senate Committee on Undergraduate Admissions in Financial Aid. She is a woman of passionate commitments who's expressed these uh, powerfully in film, but also in the administration of the university and in its classrooms. And today, she's going to share with us some of the secrets of her teaching. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Michelle. Thank you for that nice introduction. I, uh, when Michelle asked me to see if I would like to teach one of these, um, offer one of these talks, I knew right away I wanted to talk about project-based learning because that's what I've been doing here at Stanford for 17 years. And in a sense, it's um, the default for people who are teaching in visual media production that you would work with, with projects. But I've actually been able to apply project-based learning to other environments as well. So I think it's something that we all need to think about in our teaching here at, um, any, at Stanford or any large university. And I know there are probably people here today in this room who have done a lot of project-based teaching. And I'd love to have a time at the end of my talk to discuss that, because I know that there are so many different ways you can go about it. Um, let me tell you, first of all, kind of provide you a little context for where I'm coming from with the projects. And that has to do with the program that I belong <coughs> to most closely, and that's the documentary film and video program in the communication department. And I say that because many of you may not have heard of it, but it is the foundation from which I operate. And we accept um, eight to 10 graduate students every year for a two-year master's program, during which they entirely create projects to learn the skills of becoming a motion picture documentary producer. So they'll work in film, they'll work in video, they will be making projects, and when they leave, they will have four <laughs> major portfolio pieces which they will be able to share with future employers, enter into film festivals, and basically use as a way to show that they have developed an individual filmmaking voice while they're here at Stanford. I've also used um, the same techniques for project-based learning in my courses with undergraduates. I've taught, in, taught video production undergraduate courses numerous times, and um, love working with undergrads in seeing their vision come through with their undergraduate uh, video production. So that's where my start is for this topic. Um, I know that in some sorts of disciplines in the university, it's probably a little bit harder to think about bringing projects into the course. But I have to say that there are so many benefits in addition to just what the student learns, because it really creates, I believe, a very um, 
rich and very mutual learning experience for both the faculty and the students. In a sense, it um, reinforces the more mentoring and guiding aspects of teaching and in allows the students to also teach the teacher because as the students become experts with their projects, they are in fact bringing information to us as teachers that we may not have had before. So it becomes um, not exactly an equal relationship, but you know, there's so many, um, when you think about the power relationships between teachers and students, this is a, a time when that can be equalized a little bit and there's more of a mutual journey that's undertaken, if you will, which I think is really very valuable and very engaging and empowering for the students. It's also a great opportunity for students to learn how to collaborate. And I think that it's important as students get out into the world where so much of their um, work life is going to be involved in group activities, collaborative activities, task solving, that they really need to understand what that means and to develop the interpersonal skills for um, both sharing ideas with people and using other people's ideas to come together for one major project, possibly to negotiate conflict which sometimes will come up in work environments. And I think it's just giving them a chance to be launched into the real world in a way that um, we need to do as much of as we can while we're also providing students with a, a very solid liberal arts or technical education. Um, so I love doing project-based courses, and I learn something from my students all the time. In the 17 years that I've been teaching, um, I can't, I mean, I, every, it's a new adventure every time I teach a course because we're embarking on all these projects together. And it's a very exciting opportunity for me. When I, uh, Michelle mentioned I was a resident fellow at the dorms, and I remember when I was that um, we had a saying that our job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and I think that, um, in a sense, you are afflicting the comfortable when you introduce a project into a course. Students are very comfortable working with um, absorbing lots of material through reading and lecture and giving it back to us um, and interpreting it through papers and so forth or maybe by discussion and section. These are things they're comfortable with. They set their own schedule for these things. They adjust to their own work style. And it's a little bit unpredictable and uncomfortable when they undertake a group project. And so I think it's a really important new step for them to be working with other colleagues, student colleagues, trying to come up with a concept that they can develop into the project and then taking it and nursing it through along the way. So I do think that's an important part of it. And it, you will find a little resistance sometimes from students who aren't so sure they want to undertake a project. So that's something to be thinking about. Um, another reason I like project-based learning is I think it really actively engages students because they are going to be forging connections between the curriculum that's being covered and who they are as a person, what their values are, what their goals are, who they really are, the kinds of choices they make about the projects that they do within the parameters set out by the instructor have a lot to do with who they are as people. So you actually get to know the students in a different kind of a way than you might in other academic settings. And I think that's terribly important. And I think it, uh, it actually um, validates who they are and helps them find their own individual voice, even if they're working in a group. You definitely get to see the individual voices they're participating. And I think this helps them as they're developing their um, skills going out into the world and presenting themselves to people. Um, and lastly, they're developing a lot of new skills. They're developing conceptual skills. In the case of my students, their visualization abilities are being increased. Critical skills, because we do evaluate work along the way, and I want students to learn how to be critical of work. And they're developing confidence in oral presentation and certainly building their interpersonal communication skills. So I have to say I am a fan of, pro of project-based learning. And as I was taking the train to and from San Francisco thinking about this topic, I was jotting down notes about things I'd like to talk about. And I kept coming up with words that started with P. <laughs> and as a consequence, I decided that this course is really about minding the P's and Q's of project-based learning. And I'd actually like to take us through most of those P's and start by sort of talking about the Q, which is that very often designing the projects has a lot to do with asking the students sets of questions and having the students ask each other sets of questions within the group. What about this project is particularly interesting? And what topic could we pursue within this project? What, what is important to you as a person that you might want to pursue in terms of this project? So questions are very much at the basis, formulating questions that you then want to answer. Um, it's very important for people who are working on projects together. In terms of talking about the um, 
the remaining six P's. I want to t start with uh, parameters, which is basically all the course design considerations, at least the ones that I think about when I'm setting out to do my courses. And so we talk about defining parameters. The first thing you have to think about is how many students can you effectively work with if you're going to be doing a project-based course. I have actually not been able to do ambitious projects with classes larger than 18 people. So if you have a larger course, um, I think you have to think about putting the project into the course section. And I actually think that's a great idea. I think it's a great undertaking for teaching assistants to work with students on projects. I think it's very doable. Most course sections are going to be smaller than 18 students. So I think it's a great place to reside a project for a course. And it may be that that course will have other ways of measuring students' um, understanding of the curriculum through testing, through papers. And maybe there'll just be one small project, but to cite it in the, in the section, I think, is a great way to um, have an opportunity for the teaching assistants to practice with project-based learning and also for the students to be successful. So I would say, you know, it's got to be a fairly small group. Secondly, you have to think about what is the contour of the course in terms of when do you introduce the project and how long does the student have to take on what they have to undertake for that particular project to be successful. And honestly, in my view, one very substantial project is enough for a quarter. It's going to have many stages along the way. It's probably going to take a good eight weeks of the 11-week quarter. And you need a little bit of time to bring people up to speed, to give them exposure to some of the you know, kind of material they need to know in order to achieve the project. You have to provide a scaffolding upon which they can build their project. That may consist of a combination of lectures and reading and discussion. Typically, it does. But also, um, a series of small exercises sometimes are very helpful for getting students ready to do projects. In uh, film classes I've taught, for example, with undergraduates, they need to learn the basics of film grammar. One of the most important things they need to know is how to manipulate time and space cinematically, which is a fundamental underpinning of storytelling. So we give a couple of really simple exercises. Um, our most famous one is uh, you have to make a story about A meets B and goes to C to find D. <laughs> and um, it's actually very interesting to give students that assignment. It involves a lot of movement through space, and it involves very much covering a long period of time. But they have to compress that. And so it's a wonderful way for them to, to build some strength in that area. And, they become amazingly creative about who A is and who B is and where they're going and what D is. So it becomes this very exciting creative challenge. If we were to tell the same students, we want you to understand film continuity, we want you to make a tightly constructed, beautifully compressed time and space manipulation, go out and make a three-minute movie on the topic of your choice, they would be totally paralyzed. And so it's much too overwhelming. And so by giving people a structure, you're really helping them be successful with these little exercises they're undertaking, which are, in a sense, I guess I would have to say, mini projects. So um, I know at the British Film School, they actually send everyone out with the assignment to uh, make a little movie on how to cook an egg. And uh, some wonderful things apparently have ensued from that, which I have not seen, but I, I can only imagine. Um, so you know, you've got to make a project be something that will be a real challenge to the teams that are going to be undertaking it during the quarter. But you also have to make it be something that they can actually achieve. So you have to provide the scaffolding. You have to provide the preparation so that you've designed a project parameter that the students can then jump into and succeed with. So we think a lot about that. And when we are designing courses, we have a lot of discussions in my, my program about our um, projects and the curriculum and how they intersect between different courses. And my um, colleague, Jan Krawitz, and I spent a great deal of time changing projects actually from year to year. Let's try this this year. Let's do this. And so over the years, we've um, found a few things that have helped us, in particular with our students. And so the scaffolding can change. But it's important that you provide it. I also want to talk um, about too many projects and the danger of that. And um, it is possible to have a course in which you would have a series of rather small projects, maybe one every two weeks not going to build the same kind of a relationship between the teacher and students in terms of working to develop something and bring it to its um, fruition. But it can be a, a good way for students to get a lot of mastery in a lot of different areas. 
I worked on a course last year that I co-taught with one of my colleagues, Byron Reeves, um, an incoming gateway course for all entering graduate students in our department. It was called Media Narratives, working with the idea that as um, technology is converging, um, me old media and new media are coming together. We wanted to expose students to all of the sorts of media study and media making that happen in the communication department. So we decided we would organize a two-unit course around the fact that story basically unites everything that we do. We called it Media Narratives, and we assigned five projects to the students. And that was one project too many, <laughs> which we learned um, by doing. And we actually deleted a project along the way. We had students make uh, three connected web pages. We had them, and this is all in groups. We had them create a one-minute digital video edited in the camera, which is harder than it sounds. We had them uh, rewrite and edit down to a thousand words a long feature journalism story. We had them write a one to two page description of a research study with no more than two variables. And we also had them um, work in teams to come up with a one page business proposal for a media business. We actually ended up dropping the journalism assignment because people were a little bit overwhelmed. But the idea of a course in which you just jump in and try a few small projects, um, it can work. But you have to be prepared to nip and tuck along the way. You know, this was the very first time we'd offered media narratives. Next year, we're going to, this year, we're going to structure it a little bit differently so we can um, make sure that we give, give students adequate time to accomplish all that they need to do. Another important parameter for thinking about a project-based course is the expectations. I tell the students that if we're going to be working on projects together, I, I expect a pretty high standard. If you're teaching a course in the history of the French Revolution, you do not want them to show up with a guillotine made out of popsicle sticks. You are wanting them to come up with ambitious projects. They are going to be relied upon by other members in their team, and I am relying upon them, and I am giving them a considerable amount of my time outside of the class. And so I expect them to come to class. I expect them to let me know when they're not going to be at class, and there will be no incompletes for the class. Um, only with a doctor's note will I give an incomplete, and I've only had to do it twice in 17 years. Mm -hmm. The students finish the work. Now, we have a very particular reason for that, because we have, of course, fewer resources available the next quarter. The video cameras and editing stations that those students were using are now going to be used by a new set of people, so in a sense, they have to finish. Um, but I think it's really important to help the students understand that they're really embarking on something a little bit different and that they're going to be treated like professionals, and we expect them then to behave like professionals, and they do. Grading. I try whenever possible, and most of the time I'm successful, in having uh, these project-based video courses at least be past no credit. And I think it's important. You've kind of, if you've got the students worrying about a grade while they're trying to do a project that may be in an area that's a little bit new to them, the, the idea of the grade is like this unacknowledged elephant sitting in the room that makes everybody really uncomfortable. And some students are coming into the course with a lot of background that they can bring to bear and actually gives them a chance of making a more polished product, while others are really starting at ground zero and having to build. And so you don't, it's not easy to grade those kinds of project results. And so I talk to the students about it, and most of my courses are you know, satisfactory, no credit, and that's worked out very well. If I had no choice but to offer a grade, then I would want to tell the students that I would not put, um, I would want to attach weight to various stages of the process so that it isn't just the end product, but that the collaboration and the ways in which they collaborate is acknowledged and actually weighted with value for grading. Um, but I, I prefer, if possible, to avoid grades. I think in this kind of a setting, it's, it's better not to have it. It's also very important for students, and I do this very early on in the quarter, to understand the timeline for accomplishing an ambitious project in the quarter, partly because we have these benchmarks that must be met, but also because students don't always work with the most efficient timeline. I mean, often they do procrastinate, and we understand that. And so you can't start on your project the night before it's due. You can't start any part of your project the night before that particular part is due. And so we try to help anticipate that by talking about the timeline and making it very clear that at these particular stages, there will be an evaluation of sorts. We call it a critique. And that we, I'll explain that later. And that it's very important that they are ready at each step of the way. Um, context. 
hard for people to imagine what's possible with a project if you don't provide some sort of a context for them, in my view. And so I show students case studies of projects that have gone before them. And there always is that very first time you offer a project, well, create a case study then. If it's a, in my case, if it was a video project, I would go out and make a tiny video to show the students the kinds of things that are possible given these particular boundaries for this particular project. Context is incredibly important for students, gives them a nice foundation so they won't be overwhelmed, so they can go out and take on a project that's about the right size for them given their background and what they're ready to do. Um, I actually find myself taking notes from year to year on particular uh, s hurdles that students had to f work with in order to achieve success in certain projects so that if I do happen to screen a project for students, say, two years later, I won't forget what incredible impediments they had to rise above or what avenues they had to pursue in order to achieve that project. So when I talk about case study, it is more than just showing the finished project or a copy of the finished project, but actually noting and re you know, keeping an archive of the kinds of challenges that those students met along the way. So that works really well. Our, one of our first assignments um, in the graduate course is to make a three-minute black and white film in the fall quarter of their first year as young entering film students. And it, that's much harder than it sounds, by the way. And um, we spent about half a class one day with the three-minute film festival, where I show them about 15 examples of three-minute films that have gone before. And of course, I pick very different formal styles, very different topics, so they can get a sense also of some of the aesthetic considerations that they can bring to bear for the project. So I'm get, kind of getting a double whammy here, getting the context, but I'm also showing them the possibilities. And um, I think it really helps them understand where they fit within that project, which is, I think, terribly important. Next, I want to talk about partnering. And this is about how do you form the groups that are going to undertake these, these particular pieces of work. I like to, if possible, involve the class in um, active group collaboration from the start. It doesn't always work in every class I offer, but for the most part, I try to. Um, because I'm really doing basic detective work to try to figure out who might be good partners for these projects as we move along through the quarter. And early on, I make it very important that um, I, make it, I stress that I want the students to get to know each other. And again, I fall back on an old residential education trick, which is the, the game whereby you meet the person next to you and talk to them. Everybody breaks up into little groups of two. You talk to the person next to you for three or four minutes. They talk to you for three or four minutes. And then you introduce that person. You're not introducing yourself. Often people become a little bit um, tongue-tied when they're introducing themselves. Yet I find if they're introducing their neighbor, they do a much better job. Not only am I learning something about the neighbor, but I'm also learning something about the neighbor because of the way they're responding to the introduction. And then I'm learning something about the introducer in the way in which they're making that introduction. So it's a pretty uh, revelatory experience. And um, if people are obviously sitting next to people who are friends of theirs, I do try to break that up a little bit so we don't have people introducing people that they know so much, um, but actually getting people to get to know new people. Um, mm -hmm. As I move through the quarter, I um, do, you know, as I start to introduce the project, the project for the quarter, I do also try to break the class down into small groups to talk about potential ideas for these projects. And these are not necessarily going to be any of the partnerships that they're going to have later, but just to start brainstorming with other people. So I might, for example, introduce the parameters of the project, define the project, and then give everybody a minute or two just to jot down their own particular ideas just in writing on paper, just even almost like a word web of ideas that come to their mind. Then put them into small groups, maybe if it's a class of, let's say, 16, you know, three groups, you know, five, five, six, something like that, um, to start sharing those ideas amongst themselves. And the fact that everybody has something written down means that everybody has to speak. You can't just have the most dynamic people in the group say, well, what about this idea? And let's do this, or how about this? You literally have to go around the group and let everybody participate, which is really important. And at that point, that group can then break into some kind of a discussion about what three topics or what three ideas are emerging from their group that they would like to share with the rest of the group when we reconvene. And I move around the room and eavesdrop on these conversations and trying not to say very much, but mostly to observe. And just to get a sense of personalities and uh, the kinds of ideas people are coming up with, just to sort of investigate. Again, I'm looking for potential partnerings. So 
I bring them back together and I have them then present these three ideas that would be possible for the project. And I have different students in the group present each idea. So it's not one leader, because there usually is one leader, um, but three different people presenting one of each of these three ideas. So we get as many people speaking as possible. Um, you know, there are other ways as well that, that faculty put students together in groups. And I am probably sure that you've heard of this, but I do want to note it, because I think it's extremely interesting. Larry Leifer in the Mechanical Engineering Department, who's been very involved in the Learning Lab, the Stanford Learning Lab has done a lot of work on uh, project-based learning. Actually, in his uh, one of his design courses in Mechanical Engineering, he has all the students take the Myers-Briggs personality inventory test to um, actually find out their personality types. And then he puts the groups together based on complementary personality types. And that idea has actually been poached and used in a number of different places. Um, I worked with a course in Sweden last year with 80 <coughs> engineering students doing um, systems design. And they were all put together through the Myers-Briggs inventory. So it does spread a bit around the globe. I'm not personally sure how effective it is. I know I'm an ENFJ. <laughs> and I'm, marri I'm married to something that's completely incompatible with that, incompatible with that, but it's been 25 years and we're doing fine. So <laughs> I got to believe that you know, it's, it's maybe not something you want to hang your head on completely, but um, pretty interesting that they do that. Um, then I assign partners. And I can basically usually, I usually do that through email, actually. It's just easier. It's more neutral. I just say, here are the partners for this quarter's projects, and I just tell them. And by this time, of course, I've already created a class phone address and email list. And I do all three. A lot of teachers just put down email, because that seems to be the mode of discourse that's safest and easiest. But actually, I really like students to know where they, where they all live. Because I think it's important. You may have a neighbor in Stern, and you're living in Castaño. You don't eat with them, so you don't really know. And you find out that, in fact, you're, you're close neighbors. And so I like to have a full address list. There's lots of communication that's going to have to go back and forth during the making of projects. If there are multiple projects in a course over a term, then I would rotate partners, absolutely. And in fact, in our graduate program, we rotate partners throughout the whole two years that they're there. So they do um, have five different crew experiences in their first year. They, as much as possible, not working so closely with the same group of people each time. But since there are only 8 to 10 students, it gets pretty difficult. Uh, by the thesis year, the second year when they're doing their thesis projects, it's practically like an analytical question on the GRE, sort of how to put the crews together in, in yet another fresh way. Um, <laughs> but we try. And um, I think it's really important to give people the opportunity to work with as many different kinds of people as possible, and not work with the likely suspects, but with the unlikely suspects. And often they're pleasantly surprised. So that works out pretty well. Um, in terms of process, I feel strongly that students don't think enough about process, about how valuable it is to acknowledge all the steps along the way and give them the amount of attention that they need in order to be successful at the end. And so we put a lot of emphasis in our program on process, and I individually do as well. Um, I tell the students that if they have a brilliant outcome but they've been sloppy along the way, that's simply not excellence. Excellence is being mindful of the process as you move through it. Now, that isn't necessarily something that's going to happen unless you're sitting there getting involved with the students all along the way that this process is occurring. So it becomes a little bit of a time management issue because you do need to spend a considerable amount of time meeting with students outside of class. And so you need to figure out which moments are most crucial for these meetings and how long should they last and how you're going to organize things. Um, I think early on, early in the project, it's very important, particularly if you're working with partners, and that's typically, you know, paired, group, paired partners is a good way to work, two people, um, to meet separately with each group and talk to them um, about the ideas they've come up with for the project, helping them shape that project, giving them names of faculty members they might talk to to further explore the project. Um, talk to them about sort of the, some of the conceptual challenges. Here's where, you know, I'm talking about working from questions. Here where I will, is where I will ask the students a great many questions about what brings them to the project, what about this topic interests them, um, why did they select this particular twist to pursue for the project, what is it that intrigues them. Um, trying to learn a little bit more about what brings them to this. This is, again, combining the curriculum with the person having the person bring their own values and 
interest to the curriculum. I want to learn about that, but also trying to understand what's really important for them to emphasize in the project and what can maybe drop away. And of course, it's very much going to depend on what you're doing in your um, courses. In our courses, um, very often people will have highly intellectual, non-visual projects that they will present. And it's my job to inform them that this sounds like a wonderful feature story for a magazine, but it's not a movie. And that movies need to be visual. And you need to know what your movie is about. You need to know what your movie is not about. And you have to be very clear about that. And that's what the conceptualization process involves. And so meeting with students in their pair to just go through all of that is very, very important. And I typically organize, you know, the, let's say a class of 18 people, I pretty much assign, you know, nine sections of 20 minutes each. And you can accomplish quite a lot in 20 minutes, actually, um, to help shape, define, and massage that project and send the students out on their way to get to the next level of research and planning, which is when they actually do follow up. They do their library research. They get out into town and they meet subjects. They talk to different faculty members. They, they start to develop, in, in the case of my students, a film. And I expect from them to come back at the next meeting with a very fully developed pre-production package, which is what we call it. But it's a, it's a written piece that includes the, you know, a formal concept that describes what they're trying to do, the thesis statement, which gets to why they're, what they believe they want to show us through this particular project and why they want to do this. Um, background material that any reader would need to know before they would embark on watching this particular film. The actual movie, what is it going to look like? They can provide me with a sequence outline. They can provide me with a treatment. But they have to show me the movie on paper as they, as they imagine it at that point. Now, they're making nonfiction work. It's going to change. Life changes. Things change. But they have to have a structure in place that they know will be a solid film, that they know will work. And they need to be able to communicate that to me because I'm going to be helping them delete certain things, add certain things, ask questions, suggest things. I need them to have fully developed that. In the case of um, some assignments, I even require a storyboard, little sketches, so that the students can let me see sort of where they're planning to put their shots, because that kind of thoughtfulness and precision is very important when they get out in the world. The problem with uh, video cameras is that they're sort of like a hose. You can go out and shoot anything. And if you're not mindful of what actually needs to be in a shot, you're going to end up with a lot of oatmeal. So you have to be very careful about that. And then we, we talk about that. Um, it's interesting. You know, you find that sometimes students just get very set on one particular aspect of something that they must capture or get for their project. And it really isn't what the project most needs. And so it's your job to kind of gently pry them loose from that rock and make them think about a few other rocks that are, that are germane. I'm currently working with a student who is making her thesis project. And she's making it about four elderly nuns who protested last year at the School of the Americas um, protest, which happens annually. The School of the Americas is a, um, a very notorious training ground for mostly Latin American, um, well, kind of human rights violators, but contra type people in, in, in any way. There's been many protests over the years, and these four nuns were arrested. What makes it interesting is that they are 68, 71, 76, and 88 years old, and they were all sent to federal prison for six months. So her movie is about these nuns, and she's going to be getting in, you know, interviews with them in prison, but also getting them released from prison, going back to their convents. She was very upset because the School of the Americas protest this year was happening actually about two weeks ago. I've got to get my project approved. I've got to get out there. I've got to film that particular protest. And I'm going, Renee, no, you don't. Think about it. What's really important about your story? Let, you can get archival material. You can get news footage of the protest. What's really important is the relationship you're going to be building with these nuns, the access you get into the prison, the opportunities you have to follow them into the convent. The other part can be filled in. It's not going to be critical to your film. And as it turned out, she was able to get two hours of digital video footage that someone donated to her from last year's protest, which is the protest they were arrested at anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, she's in much better shape. And she used the time much better. She went back and did a site visit to the prison and met the nuns for the first time and did some you know, pre-interviewing and, and build, relationship building, which is so important for a project to be successful. Much better expense of her time. But that came from a lot of conversation that she and I had, much as I would have had with this pair of students, about what really needs to be 
part of that project and what can be set aside. And regardless of the discipline that you're working with, I know that you know, you're bringing your own skills to helping students sort that out. After the project is sort of set and ready to be launched, I don't really feel I need to meet with the students separately anymore, and that it's actually much more useful to meet with them um, using small group settings, where we'll maybe have three projects meet together. And so in my case, since I'm working with visual media, we'll be looking at, um, let's say, a rough cut and a fine cut of the work. And so three other, you know, three projects will be looked at at once. So two groups watch while I critique one set of material, and then they can offer feedback as well. And then we move all through. So they get to see the mistakes that other people made in addition to their own. And I think that becomes a much more, much more fruitful use of time for everybody involved. So we do it that way. And I think we do that along the way with the, with the, in the process, and it works really very well. Um, I also give the students a calendar at this point. You know, this, they are pretty busy with these projects. So I actually use a calendar creator program where you lay out a month on a grid, and you actually can type in the various deadlines. And the students really like this because they can then add, you know, the, the days when they're going to be doing interviews or the days when they're going to be in the library, or whatever. They can just they can put it all in there, and it's laid out for them like a quilt. So you know, it might be helpful if they don't have those calendar creator programs on their computer for you or your TA to put something together that's on a grid so that they can actually it's the timeline in a different form. The timeline's already on the syllabus, but somehow having it in some kind of a monthly calendar seems to help people. I want to talk now about problems. And I want to talk about anticipating problems, because there's going to be problems. And um, in anticipating problems, what I like to do is describe scenarios in class for problems that might occur in order to help having those problems, avoid having those problems occur later. And so we spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, in many cases, projects are going to be taking students off campus. That's hard. Stanford is a very beautiful campus. It's also an enormous campus. It's one of the largest campuses in the world, actually. Um, and you can have a very rich student life and rarely leave Stanford. Um, maybe you do, if you do public service, you get out into the community. But otherwise, you may be going to the movies, Miyake Sushi, uh, Q Billiards, and the shopping center. I mean, you're not going that many places. And so the students need help to combat that campus isolation. They need help getting out into the world. And really, I think as teachers, we need to use our own connections in the community to help students go out and find things. And I actually keep a little file of useful people in various areas that I can call upon beyond the Stanford, very rich Stanford faculty, which provides a wealth of support to student projects. Um, I try to hook them up with people in the community that can help them as they go along. And um, even something as simple as knowing, being able to tell the student that there's a directory of local organizations at the Palo Alto Main Library. And if they're looking f to work with a local organization, they can go to that directory and they can see all 120 groups that exist and have registered with the city and get their addresses and get the names of the contact people. Something that's simple. Um, and yet there's also then the physical challenges, which is how to get to the Palo Alto Main Library, because most Stanford students, if you ask them, would not even know where it is. And why should they really with the libraries that we have here? Um, but actually, physical movement off campus can be difficult for some students. And you, and you do have to think about it. Um, I especially have to think about it, because students cannot take video equipment on bicycles. Um, or if they do, I definitely don't want to know about it. Uh, but you know, really, transportation can be a problem. Far fewer students seem to have a car at that point than you think. And so they have to rely upon the Marguerite shuttle. They have to rely upon local buses, the trains. And that can kind of make it difficult, because these are repeated visits. The project's going to involve them getting off campus again and again. It's not a one-time, let's rent a bus for a field trip sort of an arrangement. This is a very significant step that they're taking, moving off campus to develop their projects. And I, th I would think that in a variety of disciplines, students are going to be getting off campus. So you have to be considering these things. In light of that, I want to talk for a minute about um, building relationships in communities that are not your own. Um, I think it's really hard for people to go into communities that they're not familiar with. And I know I've actually done a couple of years of our, my undergraduate video course where we worked with the Haas Public Service Center to partner students with projects that nonprofits and communities wanted to ha you know, wanted. They wanted videos made. Our students wanted to make videos. We brought them together. 
and there was a great assistance um, from the service learning coordinator at Haas to help students kind of understand the how, how you are sensitive to going into communities, how you have something to offer, how this community is going to teach you an awful lot, and sort of not just dumping people into communities about which they know absolutely nothing. And so um, there's a lot of communities out, out around uh, Palo Alto. I was thinking the other day about one, um, which is the only trailer park in the city, the Buena Vista Trailer Park down off El Camino. There's a community right there that's a little bit foreign and unknown. It's a little scary just to show up at the front door of the office at the Buena Vista t Trailer Park. So you have to help students get ready to do that. And again, this also is an area that you want to help students anticipate so they won't have problems, and that is how to approach people. Access and availability issues. Um, how do you make those contacts? And I do encourage students to let me know who they're contacting, and maybe even I can help them with an email or a letter, um, suggest a way that they might be able to best approach that person. And just recently, the student who's making the film about the elderly nuns um, came to me, and we worked very hard on a draft of her letter to the prison warden, trying to get permission to get into the prison. And it took a few drafts to get the wording just right. She then got permission, but now the permission for, to go back and film is very truncated. He's still thinking about the broadcast news crews that come in and cover, and she's, and we're trying to ha have a, a position for her where she's a student, but she has to also seem very professional, otherwise he's not going to let her in at all. So there's been a follow-up letter now that has been crafted that we've worked on together so that she's able to get as much time as she can in the prison with the nuns, and not just interviewing them, but actually doing the work they do within the prison. One of them works in the dining room. She'd like to get them at, she'd also like to get them at mass. So she's pushing. And in order to push, you have to ask in the right way. So we work on that together. I have another student who emailed an expert in the topic area he's pursuing for a project. And the expert wrote back and accused him of plagiarizing his ideas. And the student came to me and was completely upset and said, these are very, he said, he said, everybody writes about the same thing about this topic. I don't think this guy has a market on it. I just told him I was making this stuff. I said, well, let me see all the emails that have gone back and forth between you and this particular uh, faculty member actually at another institution. And as soon as I saw the chain of emails, it was so clear to me that it was a total miscommunication. There's no problem here. All my student needed to do was to send another email that was a little bit clearer about who he was, what the program was, what he was attempting to do, and explain that he was simply looking to this person for maybe some advice, maybe some suggestions of where to go to contact possible interview subjects or to get archival footage. He showed me a draft of the email he wrote that did that. We agreed it looked good. He sent it off. The, he got an immediate response back from the person saying, I didn't understand, and of course, I'm very happy to help you. And it was a great learning experience all around, and actually a great learning experience for me because I didn't even know this student was contacting this person, and I hadn't probably done a good enough job of encouraging him to come to me before he set out to talk to him. So again, this is a problem I didn't as fully anticipate. I somehow was thinking about the prison warden all along, but I wasn't thinking about just this other scholar. So helping students understand how to approach people, you can avoid a lot of problems if you help them anticipate that. Problem students. There always are going to be a couple every year or so, a couple years. Um, I haven't had too many, actually. But occasionally, you'll have a um, laggard who does not want to do their share for the project. And this is very, very uncomfortable. It's much easier to let a situation like that sort of fester underground than to bring it up and actually acknowledge the conflict and manage it and work it out. And I do bring this up with students, because I think it's incredibly important that they learn how to negotiate, learn how to work out conflicts, uh, and learn how to address those head on. So I actually sketch out that scenario, and I encourage people to deal with these problems when they come up right away. And if they cannot be dealt with in various ways that the students attempt, then I do encourage them to meet with me, and we'll have a little chat. And, and when, usually when I do that, I'm trying to model good negotiation skills for both students that are there. And um, basically, just using simple inquiry and active listening to get each student to give me their point of view on what they think is going on. And very often, what I thought was so clearly you know, a problem 
turns out to be more, again, a miscommunication than anything else. And often I will state back to the students what I hear them saying and ask them if that is exactly what they intend, because sometimes they don't hear themselves sometimes. And usually we're able to come to some kind of an accommodation. And I think this is an important part of working in groups. It's an important part of building collaborative skills. So um, though I don't love it when we have laggards, um, it is the way, you know, the world works that way. They're, they're going to have that, you're going to come across that in the world. So you need to, to think about it. Another, um, I don't want to exactly couch it as a problem, but something else I wanted to just mention is a, a very interesting um, experiment I was vol involved with, which had to do with distance learning project based learning. <laughs> um, interesting combination. I was invited to participate in a communication systems design course, an engineering course actually, in um, Sweden through KTH University. And they put students into groups. There are about 80 students in the course. They put them into groups of about mm, five or six. There were about 12 teams. And their job was to solve real world technical challenges that were either developed by the teachers as pro possible projects or were posited by high-tech companies like Nokia and Ericsson that then would actually provide some financial support for the students to develop the projects. To solve the, some of the cha challenges that um, this new technology needs, that, you know, products and services that need to get out, how might they be employed, what are some of the technical challenges, what are some of the marketing challenges. In any case, one of the deliverables for this particular course, in addition to all the work the students did on these high-tech ideas, was to make a video about whatever it is that their project was about. So if it was a wireless um, system for people to communicate in a school district, if it was, you know, whatever it might be, they actually had to visualize the use of that particular cutting-edge technical development. And I thought that was a great idea. I thought it was a wonderful addition to the project assignment that the students would actually have to visualize the implementation of this high-tech device or service. And that was where I came in. I was asked if I would um, try to help them improve that particular part of the deliverables, because they had some pretty mediocre um, productions up until that point. So I agreed to design some uh, web course modules that covered some of the basics of media literacy and visual thinking and all of that, and how you go about making a little project. Did about um, seven chapters of that. And then they asked if I would come to Sweden to deliver some lectures introducing the students to some of these ideas, which I did do. But I only did it on the, <clears throat> I only did it if I could also meet with the students for these very same kinds of group separate idea meetings that I had been having all along with my students here at Stanford. So three hours, I was there for two days of lecturing, but one whole three hour block was set aside so that the students were in groups around the room and I would just move from group to group and spend 15 minutes with, with each group talking about the possible visual ideas they were starting to come up with for their project, which did a couple of things. First of all, I was able to help them with their shaping. Second of all, they, they were able to let me know a little bit about them, and I was able to let them know a little bit about me. So we had a little bit of a connection, a very direct connection, because I knew that I was going to be going back to Stanford, and they were going to be sending me little versions on QuickTime video format of their movies, and I was supposed to send them back feedback. And I was quite concerned that if they saw me as this monolith that they didn't know that the, that, that would just completely, I'd be singing into a well. And so um, actually I was surprised it worked quite well. Um, they would send me their cuts, I would send them the feedback. They'd send me a later cut, I would send them my feedback. And um, the videos turned out to be pretty good. So I think um, it's possible even in those sorts of settings to make uh, these kinds of relationships work. But it has a lot to do with a, mo a point of intersection, a point of connection that you have with the students so that you, you know, you've evidenced some engagement with their project, you've shown them that you are concerned about it, you've offered your ideas, and then you move on, and if it has to happen through a long separation and through email, it's okay. Progress. Giving students feedback as they move through this process. Very, very important. Um, I think regular feedback and evaluation will both improve the projects but, and keep the students on track. Um, but also allows you to come up with new ideas that you would never have thought of before about ways to make this project better. Sometimes students will embark on a topic, and I'll tell them everything I know about that topic, suggest all the people they ought to talk to. Yet, <clears throat> as the project starts to move along, 
it takes a little turn. And when I next see it, all of a sudden, I'm presented with a lot of new opportunities and ideas that I can present to them because they've moved the project in a slightly different direction. That takes regular meetings so that you can give the feedback that they need and give that kind of input. So I, I've actually really enjoyed meeting with students along the way. Um, in our program, we do something called critique-based feedback, which you certainly see in, in all art programs, um, where students put their work up, and it's critiqued, sometimes brutally, um, by faculty and students alike. I am not brutal, but I'm honest. Um, the critique is very important for the students. Not only does they get very good feedback, but they, they learn that you can actually um, put work out there and that the actual evaluation of that work is not really personal. You know, when students are writing papers, they receive the paper back probably at the beginning of the following quarter, because they're long gone for vacation while the faculty member is writing all their notes. Um, they get the paper back, and there are many notes on it. And it's good feedback, but it's about the paper. It's on the paper. It's written down. It's not face to face. And so they're able to make that separation between who they are as a person and this particular product that they've created, which is their term paper. Um, in the case of actual benchmark evaluations along the way in a project, that critique can feel very personal. The person is sitting in the room. You've got the faculty member in there as well as other peers. And it's very important to not be the total salt in the pudding, but to actually um, be able to give very constructive feedback to the students. And, and it is critical, but um, I'm pretty careful, and I wasn't so much so when I first started, but I'm mindful now that you have to usually uh, almost sandwich <laughs> some of your feedback. So you say something positive about the project, then you hit them with your critique, and then you end on a positive note. And they hang on to those positive bits. They're very important. It helps them hear the rest. And uh, I find that very important. Um, but what I like about their critiques is that students are going to go out into the world, and they're going to be presenting ideas that are going to be shot down in work situations. And they need to learn that, in fact, it's not personal, that it's about the idea, it's not about them. This is a good practice for them. And it also is useful for them because they're also learning themselves to develop their own critical skills. So very often, when we're looking, for example, at a student's project, I will, at, before I even speak, I will turn to one of the students in the room and say, well, what, what do you think? And this is very useful for a number of reasons. First of all, it means they've got to pay attention because they don't know when I'm going to call on them. <laughs> Secondly, they're actually being critical. They're watching the work and they're saying, oh, that really doesn't work there. And they're able to actually give that feedback. And usually, they make great comments, wonderful, wonderful comments. So it's a very useful. Um, endeavor, and I think that over the year with my graduate students in the film program, I absolutely see them develop their critiquing skills, and they become much better at understanding how movies are put together because they're watching this critique process over and over again, and that repetition is extremely valuable. So I like that very much. Um, lastly, presentation. The actual formal acknowledgment of the students' efforts at the end. Some way of presenting the project to the class as a whole, either through, a, in our case, it's a little film festival in a screening room, which is kind of nice. Um, but you need to validate the amount of hard work that went into these pretty major projects that are the summation of sort of the students' work for the term. And so we typically do this in the last day or two days of, co of the class, usually in one day. And sometimes we may have to add an hour to the class meeting, but it's really nice if you can happen if it happens all in one day. And really let the student present the work. If they're going to um, present it, they usually have to make some sort of a slight, quick oral presentation beforehand, which again is helping them improve their oral skills. Um, if they want to provide a short outline of how they plan to prevent that, I can work with them on their oral presentation. Um, they then present the work. And this is not a time to, at this point, I feel, give any kind of critical feedback. I don't think it helps at the end, when the work is finished, to say, gee, that was OK, but it could have been better. Because honestly, when you're sitting in a room with your peers, you know if it could have been better or not. You know if you could have worked harder or not. And you have that moment of recognition when you realize your work perhaps is not as good as the work that came before yours or after yours, or that it held up pretty well. But I do tell the students, you know, you've got to accept that this particular piece of work captures where you are at 
on November 29th, 2001, and then you're going to move on, and the next project's going to look a little different because you've picked up all these new skills, and you've learned how to do these things. So, I mean, I know it's very hard for students. They tend to be hard on themselves. Um, I know uh, it always makes me think of that quote by Milan Kundera, uh, the goal of every author is to write a book smarter than he or she is. And, uh, you know I, know, I know at the end you sometimes get a little bit concerned that you haven't quite managed to pull it off. But I really think the presentation moment is extremely important, and it would be a shame not to have it. And then the quarter is over, and you don't have any term papers to grade. <laughs> so you've put a huge amount of energy into the front end of the learning. You've built these relationships with your students. You've um, helped broker collaboration and helped the students learn to collaborate. Um, and the, they will come back to you and talk to you about how much this helped them. I've had lots of students return over the years and stay in touch and talk about how these projects help them find their voice in a new way or help them function well in a professional work environment. Um, and I have to say that, for me, I learned something with each student project. And so it keeps my work fresh. It keeps me very excited about what I do. And uh, that is all I really want to share with you today about project-based learning, with the exception of one thing, which is that um, I was taught through project-based learning and uh, when I came to Stanford for graduate school. And I want to acknowledge my mentor and emeritus uh, colleague, Ron Alexander, who is here today, who taught me more about teaching and filmmaking than anything. So thank you. Questions?